Hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattled Magazine. And welcome to your Critique of the Week. It's Friday, April 5th. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, we're going to look at two familiar faces today on the Critique. We've got Mary Keating up first with some formal poems, uh, some forms that I've never heard of before. A Yadu and a Espinella. So that'll be interesting. We'll take a look at those. And then we also have Colin Sandberg, another familiar face. He's been a frequent lately on the open lines. He'll be here sharing, a, well, he'll be, I don't know if he's in the audience, so his poems will be here anyway, sharing a two with a Christian angle. So we'll f- see those pair of poems and we'll take a look at uh, everything we've got. Let's see who is here today. We have great crew over on YouTube. Mary is here, Mary Keating. Hey, Mary. We got Fady. We've got Katie Dozier downstairs. We've got Tom Barlow. Brian O'Sullivan's here, Dee Coleman, James Langford, Ruth Kennedy, Rebecca Kate, Joe Barca. Hey, Joe. We've got Sharon Ferrante. We've got Elizabeth Wolf, Gary Rossens here, Winston Munn, Dick Westheimer, Clayton Clark, Sandra Fees, uh, Cindy Guntherman, Jamie Thomas, uh, Angela Eureko Smith, uh, Laura Benjamin, um, uh, PMB is here, Chelsea McClellan. And Bethany Jarmel. So really great group of poets here to look at these four poems today. And uh, over on Facebook, let's see if that's doing anything. we got six people watching on Facebook. Yeah, but six great people. And uh, Jenny Middleton's one of them. Radoslav Stoyanov is here. And Nate Jacob in the comments. Good to see you all hanging out on the uh, Facebook. And Twitter. Still can't figure out how to, <laughs> how to view live comments on Twitter. I don't know. I know they're there, but audience let me click now i just don't understand twitter's twitter's format but anyway this is the uh, critique of the week as always the goal is to give it that workshop experience um of allowing you to hear what strangers think about your poems what works what doesn't you know we are the actual readers of poetry here um sitting around the you know several dozen of us um, we're the kind of people who read poetry magazines and uh, enjoy poems and want to read more poems and so it's good to know what you know, we think, how we respond to your work, what works, what doesn't. Leave as many comments as you can in the chat window. I'll pass along as many as possible, and um, and we'll try to see what we can what we can make of these poems. Now let's dive right in to uh, Mary Keating's poems, and let me pull that up. Um, and so, like I said, these are two poems that I'm not familiar with the form at all, but thankfully Mary left a nice ex- explanation of them in the submission. So um, here this goes right now this is um oh i have to sneeze hang on maybe it's a false uh okay not a false alarm that was a real sneeze okay so let's take a look at this is a yadu um so the yadu um has a subject about seasons and the feelings they invoke Five line stanzas, four syllables, first four lines, fifth line, any number. And there's a rhyme scheme. The fifth syllable of line one rhymes with the third of line two. The second of line three line rhymes with line four and five, end rhyme. If you got all that, I can't even keep track. The fun thing about form, and this was an old submission, uh, we should mention. This was something that I didn't notice Mary was down there way back from... Um, um, from uh, well, September 22nd. I guess that's not that old. Uh, but Mary asks about rhyming poems. She says, um, attached her two form poems. Though rhyming poems and form poetry don't seem to be as popular as free verse, forms help create poems that may not have ever been, which is the whole point, too, of rhyming poems and, and using form, is to if you're using it right, it's using it to generate new content. Um, it's to make poems that surprise yourself. The whole goal is to try to pull out things that you didn't think, you didn't know you knew out of your subconscious. And one of the techniques to do that is to focus so much on these rules, like the Yadu, which has many, many rules, to focus so much on the rules that you're sort of, your willful will, the part of your brain that th- is trying to write a great poem and getting in your way <laughs> is, is uh, so distracted by uh, trying to pay attention to all these rules that uh, even though it loves rules, I mean, that's the thing. The left brain loves rules. The right brain sees everything all at once and hates rules. And, and they're always in conflict, like the, you know, the left and the right sides of government. And um, so we throw sort of the uh, rule-loving um, attention, f- you know, focused attention, left brain. We throw them all these, like, things to play with and have to focus on. So then we can get the subconscious, the, the right brain that's usually nonverbal, to emerge with these interesting connections and, and the music and the ambiguity. And uh, and so that's what that's why writing uh, 
writing in form works. And so having all these rules that I can't even keep track of after reading this form really helps. So that's the whole point. Um, she asked, though, in my poetry groups, the trend is turning back to more formal styles, and rhyme doesn't seem to be shunned so much as it used to be. Do rattle editors have a preference for free verse? And the answer is no. I um, you know, I like all kinds of poetry. I think there's music in, in free verse. There's music in um, sort of long prose-ish type poems. Um, but I especially love music, too, in formal poems. And I love regular meter. I love rhyme, especially when it's like slanted and twisted and strange. And we get a lot of variety and variation in the syntax with that. The uh, current episode of The Poetry Space, which just came out with uh, Wendy Vitalock, is a great one to listen to for this topic. We just released it with Katie. That's the podcast I do with Katie once a week, uh, Katie Dozier. And we um, uh, talk a lot about, about rhyme and, and form with Wendy Vitalock, who is just the master at it. She's one of my favorite poets because of that. And uh, so that's a good thing to take a listen to. So, um, but let's take a look. Oh, yeah. Do rattle editors have a preference for free verse? Um, the answer is no. Um, I, I wish we had more, and I, and, you know, long-time viewers know I've been complaining and lamenting the fact that there's so little formal poetry submitted, um, and it's always, if it's a formal thing, and Katie can attest to this too, it gets a little boost. It's like bonus points. You know, if there's two poems, um, two poems side by side, and they kind of have both the same emotional resonance or the most, the same amount of, like, interestingness to it, the most memorability, they're similar, I'd go with a formal poem every time because we don't have enough. You know, I, I want to have variety within our pages. I want you to turn the page. Every time we turn the page, it's a surprise. And it's, if it's always free verse poems, it's not a surprise. You know, it's not as much surprise as if you might turn to a sonnet or a guzzle or a, um, or a yadu. So uh, we always want more form because that, that makes for a more ver- varied and interesting experience as you read. And uh, so there's that too. Okay, so now that with all that uh, dialogue taken, <laughs> um, let's... Uh, Let's see. Elizabeth Wolf says that's because formal poets submit elsewhere. I don't think that's the case. It's because, yeah, so Elizabeth Wolf says that's because formal poets submit elsewhere. We value rattle for free form. That's not true at all. It's just that um, there aren't as many people writing in, in formal poetry anymore. I mean, we love, you know, we had um, from the Powwow River Poets, um, who was founded by Rena Espayat, who's one of our favorite poets. We publish her all the time. She founded that group that focuses on um, formal verse. And we have, um, um, you know, we just had who um, Jose Edmundo Campo Reyes from that group. We've had A.M. Juster on many times from that group. So, like, groups like that, there's a the group of formal poets at the Eurotosphere, um, around the Able Muse, uh, people like um, Anna Evans, who I love on the Rattlecash. We're going to have her back on the Rattlecash because I just blurbed her book, actually. She has a new great book coming up. Um, so there are a, um, a lot of, you know, there's little groups that submit, but it's not as many as um, the poets who write in free verse. It's just the, you know, the mode, and so that's how we get to. Um, anyway, let's go to the poem, though. That's enough. That's enough preamble. Under the Stars, a Yadu poem. Under the Stars. And this is a, actually a recent edit that, um, uh, that Mary sent not too long ago, after I, after I let her know that she uh, was going to be this week, she sent this updated version. It used to be called something else. So this is Under the Stars, a Yadu poem. When oaks become redheads, summer succumbs to fall, colors that pop atop every deciduous treetop, masking the loss that creeps moss-like across headstones of discarded dreams, until winter's bombarded by bursts of spring, of buds bringing birds singing praise to earth's payload. Daffodils, primrose, sweet elysium, explode in fresh delight, until night dims, sun's light again. Life comes and goes while the heavens do, do si do. Sorry, life comes and goes while the heavens do si do. That's an interesting one. I, and, uh, you know, you hear when the rhymes come in, that works really nicely. That pop a top is a nice one, too. Somebody already pointed that out in the notes, and I really do like that, that rhyme there. Um, um, so let me look at the, the form of this. Um, so it's five line stanzas. I'll try to make sense of this. Five line stanzas. So we got the five line stanzas, as you can see. Um, Four syllables in the first four lines, and the fifth can be any number. So it's syllabic up to here. And I talked to um, the, the most interesting to me episode of the Rattlecast about syllabic poetry was talking to A.E. Stallings about two years ago. 
And because I don't really like syllabic poetry as a the music I don't hear. And I always thought, like, something maybe is wrong with me. Like, other people might listen to syllabic poetry. I didn't realize that some languages are, t- are timed in syllables and some are timed in stress, and English is timed in stress, so we don't really hear syllables, and that's not the point. The point is to have one of those artificial constraints that make you sort of think and focus on something and let surprising words come out. It's a way to trick your conscious mind, like we were talking about earlier. And so um, so that's the point of the uh, the syllables. You don't hear them. But they helped in composition and make the poem, you know, force the poem in interesting directions, which is always nice if you're using them right. Um, so, and then, but the rhyme scheme is what I want to see. So, the fourth syllable of rhyme line one, come, um, rhymes with the third of line two and the second of line three. This is complicated. The third of line two, come, some, so become summer, and the Second of line three, so it's like a it like sort of the rhyme falls backward. Um, interesting, and the last uh, the lines four and five end in rhyme. That's a really interesting rhyme scheme, falling on syllables like that. So become some and comes succumbs. So it's become summer succumbs, and they sort of fade back, and then you have this line. So there's really weird shape to the rhyme which is not something you see very often, but it fits there, the form, and uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Joe Becker says rhymes planted here or there. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the content of the poem, and, and we'll think about that now that we sort of understand the structure, too. When oaks become redheads, summer succumbs to fall colors that pop atop every deciduous treetop. Um, to me, even though I like the pop atop, It feels like one too many rhymes there. It gets a little sing-songy, and that's not a rhyme that's prescribed in the form. Um, Right? Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not seeing it there. Um, And then, the yeah, so we have, we don't have dreams. And to me, it feels like too much. I really love the pops atop, but then once you get to the treetop, that one feels forced. So so I think I'd maybe rearrange this, even though I like the pop atop, or maybe a slant rhyme off that. Like, why not play with that? Like, tap instead of top. And maybe we could get a little variation there, even though, you know, the form doesn't make it. But the but this rhyme here kind of makes you want to. Um, Deb T says, I like the oaks becoming redheads. And I do, too. I like the start of it. When oaks become redheads, summer succumbs to fall. Colors that pop atop every deciduous treetop. Masking. See how it's like two, the rhymes are too, too, too many strong rhymes too close. And it gets a little sing-songy in that section. Um, so that's why to pull that down. But... Colors that pop atop every deciduous treetop, masking the loss that creeps moss-like across headstones of discarded dreams until winter's bombarded. So we have the discarded, bombarded rhyme, and then the loss, moss, and across, so that we have that rhyme, too. It's really interesting. Hmm. So, um, yeah, okay, let's continue. So we, so we have the setup. When oaks become redheads, it's fall. Masking the loss that creeps moss-like across headstones. I like that section, too. I, like, I think this might be my favorite section of the, book, of the poem. Masking the loss that creeps moss-like across headstones. And you can feel the way that the line, you know, the syllabic base rhyme there feels nice to say. I like that. And um, Deb T says so, too. Um, yeah. Um. Mary Keene says I can just delete a top. Yeah, yeah, I think I might. Um, or or do something different. Um, yeah. Um, even though the form says that, like we want to have the best poem despite the form too. We don't want to have the poem be like forced to where it shouldn't go to fit the form. I mean, that's the danger. We talked about the goal, uh, the, the reason to write in form. But the danger is that you let the form drive the content too much. And even though you're trying to let your left brain you know, um, be distracted and not get in the way of the poem. Um, sometimes it does anyway, and you and you sort of end up driving, having the form drive the poem instead of free the poem. And that was, that's sort of the the line we walk with formal poetry. Winston Munn says, "Can consonants replace end rhyme?" Now yeah, you can do whatever you want in a poem. I'd say. Um, anyway, until winter's bombarded by bursts of spring, but buds bringing birds singing praise of Earth's payload. Daffodils, primrose, sweet, asylum, elysium, elysium, how do you say that? Elysium, explode in fresh delight. I like the, um, the nice, the nice um, use of enjambment here, breaking in through, you know, the syntax breaks through this, not just line, but stanza. 
in a way that feels really nice. Until night dims, sun's light again. Life comes and goes while the heavens do si do. And so to me, what's missing in this poem is, um, is some kind of like satisfying like ending. It didn't go in a place that, that surprised me. Um, it's sort of this end, life comes and goes while heaven do si does. Um, it's sort of a summary of what we've seen in the poem rather than some kind of surprising new twist. And so it's, for this, for me, um, you know, I would try to think of a way to leap to somewhere. You know, you sort of want to be distracted by the form so much that something surprising bursts out that you wouldn't have expected to say. And I think that, um, yeah, Joe Barker says a cut could help. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like in a, if we have, think about a, how a hyphen is structured, we have the haiku that's so different from the content that we have to leap across that gap and sort of make the connection. And then our old neurons start firing. We get excited about the poem. And that's what's missing here. So instead of, um, you know, instead of life comes and goes, will heaven, the heavens do si do, like if you sort of meditate and let your mind wander and then leap to somewhere, what could we leap to that's like different, like not like not this topic, not the topic of the seasons and the change and the heavens going around and life coming. But but what can we leap to that we don't expect at all that somehow relates in a way that we don't understand? And that's what the poem is missing is that leap in the end of something, because the rest, I think, works pretty well. Um, yeah. So Cindy Gutman says, yes, it is pretty, but needs a turn. Yeah. Um, Angel Heart Light says a little turn. Yeah. And so that's what we're missing. Yeah. D. Coleman points out that rhyme scheme is interesting. The rhymes are noticeable, but create a beautiful flow through the poem. They do. I really like the form. I like the way that that works. And Deb T. says, instead of the heavens do si do, I wonder if someone else could do si do. And yeah, I think that's that's where my mind was going, too. I wonder if... if um, what is the do? Could, it, could the kids be do si doing? Or, or the... Some kind of image of something else though something surprising that's that's not part of the poem um joe barker says the disco ball cracks and falls brainstorming <laughs> that's a haiku right there um pmb says a poem about change of seasons needing a turn yeah every poem needs a turn because poems are magic spells um you know a turn uh, we had we debated this a little bit on our turns episode of the poetry space with katie um, a while back, you know, uh, poems all need a sense of movement. They can't be, they're magic spells, they're transformative. They're utterances of musical speech that transform in some way. They have to take an emotional state to a different state. They have to resolve something. They have to make a connection at the end. They have to do something. It's almost like a poem um, that stays in the same place, even if it's about change. It's just change, change, change. There's, it's almost like it's not a, there's no verb. Like you can think of a poem as a whole sentence and we have the object and the subject, but you need a verb. <laughs> you need something to move or else it's not really a, you know, um, nothing's happening. It's not a complete sentence. It's not a complete poem unless something changes, something moves, something happens. Um, and so a lot of times we call that a turn and the easiest way to show it is within the, the volta in a sonnet or the cut in a haiku, but it's all the same kind of thing. We have start in one mental state and then go to another mental state and, and follow that progress, like the plot, the arc of a plot. You know, there's some sense of motion. It can be as sudden or gradual, but there's be some kind of motion going on. And, um, and the problem is this starts in the, st ends in the same place. And, um, and, uh, and so there's no sense of that movement. And so we need something surprising somewhere to go, especially with a short poem. That's why cuts that, the quick cuts in the haiku are so good in that short poem, because we have room for a lot of motion when we take a big jump cut like that. And so here, I think a jump cut would be great. Um, you know, there's other ways you can also sort of evolve down the page to have a sense of movement, but it needs to be something happening. Um, Chelsea McClellan says, Mary, if you wanted to portray the heavens not caring, another idea could be a specific event described in the second to last line. Yeah, there you go. Like something happens. Um, you know, like, like, um, you know, when the, uh, where are we? Let's go to, um, daffodils, primrose, sweet, elysium explode in fresh delight until night dims the sun's light again. I do this, you know, I do something, you know, I... I don't know. You some someone do something, um, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, disjunction is needed," said Winston Munn. Yeah. 
Jamie Thomas says, I like the head hair metaphor in the first two lines. That's an interesting idea, too, the head and the hair. Um, could, like, the sun's light, let's see, uh, in fresh light until night dims, the sun's light again, and I dye my hair. <laughs> or something like that, some kind of thing like that, where it's, like, just surprising. Um, Dick Westheimer says, for me, what is the most exciting thing about writing a poem? When that door out of the poem reveals itself to me and I dare to open it. And exactly, that's it. Um, Winston Munn says, like in Duffy's, I've wasted my life. You know, that the bronze butterfly and I'm laying in the hammock, you know, and then all of a sudden I've wasted my life. Um, yeah. PMB says, the he heavens lament how nothing ever changes. Yeah. So we're, we're sort of circling around the kind of thing we want to do. We just have to figure out what we want to do, and that's really the poet's job. So is it in a critique thing, we can't really do it, but we can sort of just come up with ideas. Yeah. As Mary says, I'll have to go meditate. But that's really what's missing in the poem. Otherwise, I think it, it works great. There's a really nice music to it, and I like the form, as strange as it, as it is. So um, thanks for sharing that. Okay, let's move on to the next poem. Yeah. Winston Munn points out, I really like the structure of rhyme in the top of the stanzas, but not so much the end rhyme. Um, yeah, and, and that's interesting, too. But, I mean, this is the form. So if you're going to write in this form, you know, the end rhyme is there. And uh, I don't know. I think it's, it's interesting. I, I'd like to see some other forms. There's such weird, obscure forms that I've never seen, like, a great poem in that form. You know, and I think maybe this is one of them. I'd be curious to see. I bet you could do it. Um, but I don't know. I, haven't, I don't know one. Um, and in fact, I don't even know what this, um, um, I don't know, lost my train of thought. But anyway, yeah. Okay, let's look at the other one, too. We have another um, interesting form, another very short um, syllabic type, I think, yeah, um, form. This is the Espinella, which I think I've heard of this one before, at least. I'd never heard of the Yadu. Uh, but the Espinella, I don't know, but I think I've heard of. First stanza has four lines. Second stanza has six lines. So we got a ten-line poem. Eight syllables per line. Rhyme scheme is A, B, B, A, A, C, C, D, D, C. And what's interesting about, um, you know, all these forms almost um, come out of the French. They usually do these syllabic, complicated forms. And it's because the French have so many rhyming words, and it's a syllabic language. And so I guess, I mean, I don't speak French, but if you, if you speak French or fluent in it, you really hear sort of the rhythm of the syllable as sort of the level of, of measure of length. Um, and so you have sort of a need for more variation and more play with that kind of thing because there's not as many fun rhymes to play with. Um, and that's really why so many syllabic strange forms come out of the French. Um, and here we have another one. And, and they're fun to do in English, though, because we get to, like we said, have ways to sort of force us into surprising directions that we wouldn't have gone otherwise. So... Um, Let's take a look at this one. First, first stanza has four lines. Second stanza has six lines, eight syllables per line. So we get, uh, you know, 80 syllables total in the, in the poem. And then rhyme scheme is A, B, B, A, A, C, C, D, D, C. And if you know, um, you know, how these sort of rhyme, maybe, I don't know if we've ever mentioned this, but this is a way to talk about the rhyme in the poem where the A, the lowercase A means that the f end, end of the first line will rhyme with the end of the second line. If you capitalize, it would mean that it's exactly the same line. Um, and so the first and fourth line rhyme with each other, and the second and third line rhyme with each other. Then the second stanza, this rhyme from the first stanza is pulled through, so it repeats, cookie C. And then the CC, so the these two rhymes treat and treat. And then DD, so these two loose and juice. And then the sweet pulls back the C. So that's how the, that's how the we notarize that for anybody new who's not used to seeing it that way. Um, here we go. Amuse Boucher? Bouche? Amuse? I don't know how to even say that because I'm very ignorant. Amuse Bouche, maybe. Somebody will tell me how terrible that was in the comments. Please do. Okay. Shadowed under the weeping tree. Quiet as a decaying log. We did the skunk to spray the dog hunting for her like a prize cookie. With one squirt, that canine would see a skunk as no black and white treat. Run howling away in retreat. The moment ripe, the skunk let loose, coating the mutt in her vile juice. The beast licked his paws, oh, so sweet. Yeah. So, um, 
So James says boosh, yeah. And it was, well, it says, I think that's an appetizer. I, I, looked, I looked at these poems ahead of time, and this is one of the submissions where, uh, or the weeks where I really don't know a lot about the topics. I'm going to have to Google some things. So um, amuse bouche means literally it amuses the mouth. I like that a lot. Poems can be amuse bouche, it amuses the mouth. The French were using amuse, amuse, or maybe amuse bouche as a word for appetizers when English speakers embraced the culinary term almost a quarter century ago. So how would they say the first part, too? Can someone help me with that? Anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Laura Benjamin says it's a wonderful title. Yeah, I like the, I like the title, too. I, I like that as an Ars Poetica-type title, too, because that's what a good poem should do, what a formal poem should do, too. Um, shadowed under the weeping tree, quiet as a decaying log. I think I like the first stanza better than the second to me. Way to the skunk to sway the dog, hunting her like a prize cookie. There's something like playful and kind of fun about that. Um, yeah, Winston Munn says I really like the two opening lines. Yeah. Um, With one squirt that canine would see, a skunk is no black and white treat. Um, run howling away and retreat. I think the treat and the treat, I would pick a different rhyme because it's so close. You know, the treat and retreat are really, instead of, um, you know, what we were talking about, instead of the CC there, it's really almost, it's really like CC like that. And that, I think that makes it um, uh, a little too, it stands out a little too much. We want the rhymes to be a little subtle, sort of, you know, you sort of, one thing we didn't really talk about a whole much is the, the really the the system in our minds that makes us like rhyme. We like to look for a form, and then we're rewarded when we recognize the form. But we're at, but we sort of then we habituate to it, so we get bored, and we don't get that sort of reward in the dopaminergic channel in our brain if it's like the exact same thing too much. And so we really we feel this sort of rewarding feeling because we're always looking for patterns and looking for how our how pattern how our models of the patterns are wrong. Um, we um, like things that are like like we recognize the pattern but it's slightly off so we can like adjust our model and we get a little reward for that and that's really what the pleasure of rhyming comes from and so having those perfect rhymes exactly um, especially and that's the problem with a lot of end stop sing songy rhymes it's exactly what you expect it gets boring um but the same thing can happen when you have the whole um the whole phoneme the same in the rhyme so treat and treat repeating there it doesn't give us the same reward as the others do and it feels like a letdown a little bit. So I would go with a different rhyming word there. Um, Lisa Seidenberg says black and white meat. Like, that's a skunk. Um, but that, that, to me, I think this, li this line feels a little forced. A skunk is no black and white treat. Like, that's not the way you would say it, really. Otherwise, it's sort of f f made to fit the form. I think that could be done a little better. Like, I really love the shadow under the weeping tree, quiet as a decaying log, waited the skunk to spray the dog. That, that feels a little more natural, even though the rhymes emerge out of there. Um, yeah. Um, so anyway. With one squirt that Cannon would see, a skunk is no black and white treat. Um, run howling away and retreat, the moment ripe. The skunk let loose, coating the mutt in her vile juice. The beast looked his paws, oh so sweet. And who is the beast? Um... Dick Westover says, I most often look at the second page of Rhyme Zone when looking for a rhyme to drive a poem. That's a really good, good thing. You want something down the list that's like a little bit off. Um, Colin Sandberg says, loving the interplay between the title and the body of the poem is to treat the skunk, the spray, the skunk paw. I'm having a little trouble. Um, did the dog... So Mary King says the dog did eat the skunk. Okay, I was having trouble... Um, Yeah, I'm having trouble following the actual story. Um, hmm. I'm looking at the at the form. Yeah, so Deb T says, I think the skunk is the beast, but that word did throw me out. And that's the thing that confused me. So I think, so who, and Mary Keating said the dog ate the skunk, which I did not get from the poem. And I think that's the issue at the end of the poem for me. So, so Mary King says dogs like smelly things, and the skunk didn't doesn't realize that. Um, 
Yeah, so so I didn't get that the the skunk was actually eaten by the dog at the end. Um Though the dog is hunting her like a prize cookie. Um, with one squirt, the canine would see a skunk is no black and white treat, run howling away and retreat the moment ripe. The skunk let loose, coating the mutt in her vile juice. The beast licked its paws. Oh, so sweet. Yeah, it's, it's tough to get that through. Hmm. Yeah, so everyone's saying, too, they didn't understand you know, literally what happened. I, I didn't know who the beast was, which was the problem. Um... Hmm. So, so again, I think this is a poem that's sort of missing its ending. Katie Dozier says, I think the title is a little confusing to me that he ate the skunk because I think of amuse, or however you say it, as being tiny. Yeah. So this is an interesting one. It's Again, it's a good start, but I think it hasn't found the ending of it yet. Um, and, and here maybe the clarity um it's just the issue because i because i don't think anybody got that the it's confusion about who the beast was the beast licked his paws um you know to me i I saw the beast still because of the the juice being vile and you know how you usually think of a dog and skunk interaction um i thought of the squirrel licking its or i mean not the squirrel the skunk licking its paws so um um yeah Yeah. So Elizabeth Wolf says, who ran away? And what, just based on, I wouldn't have known this except for uh, that Mary said that the dog eat, ate the skunk. But what happened is the skunk, you know, the skunk was being hunted by the dog, but didn't realize it, thought that the scent would protect it um, and that it would just squirt the dog and it would run away. Um, but little did the, the skunk know that the dog likes the smell of skunk. And actually, the funny thing is, I like the smell of skunk too. I don't know. I think when we drive by in, in a car, you know, and it smells, everyone else is like, ew, and I'm always like, oh, that's kind of nice. It makes me think of nature and feels earthy, a lot of umami in there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, it's not like something I would put on my salad, <laughs> but um, but it's not bad. I don't know. It's not, um, it could be worse. Um, okay. Yeah, so anyway, so it's a clarity issue, too. Um, and, and maybe we can figure that out. And I think the oh-so-sweet I like the way it goes back to the Amuse. Hmm. So it's just a matter of cramming that story in. Yeah. Laurel Benjamin says skunk smells like Chinese food to me because it's like the chili oil. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Katie says there's not umami in there though. I don't know. There's like this earthy. It's it, it just it triggers like feelings of nature to me. Colin Samberg says it smells like weed to me. Yeah, that's not a bad smell either. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dick Westerham says you've obviously not been sprayed by one. No, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Although my neighbor, my neighbor, um, the one, the Youngs, remember the Youngs poem I wrote? The neighbor, um, the David Armstrong got sprayed by a skunk once when we were uh, playing Ghost in the Graveyard. And um, I guess I just didn't get close enough to him to really uh, learn to detest that. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so so some clarity in this poem, but but nice use of the form, I think, is the takeaway. Both poems, um, you know, finding the right ending that sort of feels complete and, like, surprising at the same time is really the trick. Um of, of poems, really, but especially these short formal poems. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to the other poem, which is uh, interesting. This is Colin Sandberg, too. So that, that those poems first were Mary Keating, and thanks for sharing those, Mary. Um, some really interesting forms to play with, too. And let's take a look next at uh, Colin Sandberg's pair of poems. Here we go. Let me switch up this... Uh, document view I believe it's this one yep there you go Colin Sandberg and um, here, let me slide this kind of down a little bit so we can see a little more there we go okay so Colin Sandberg uh, broken for you is the first and it's got it's just you know you're getting into it's got this prose then it 
breaks out into this short form. So almost like Hive and like. And about it, Collins said he wanted to know. Um, um, let's see where it goes. Some things that you guys should know about these poems that they are explicitly re- religious from a Christian perspective. I'm gearing these poems for a Christian audience, particularly the literary Christian community, which I feel a strong draw to be involved with. I think these two poems are some of my recent best, but I'm a little, uh, still a little hesitant about them and would love your feedback to get these last touches or extreme overhauls if needed done before they're shipped off. I look up to you all and I'm eager for these poems to be benefited by your erudite screenings. Well, thanks for that. Um, Let's see, wondering if the first poem needs to be shortened and the second might need to be expanded. Um, interesting to hear about the um, literary Christian community. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware, really, how much of one there is. I mean, there's First Things, um, that great Catholic magazine that publishes a lot of poems, and uh, A.M. Jester was the editor there for a while. Um, you know, we had a Poets of Faith issue um, with a lot of Christian poets, and I'm sure, I mean, my favorite, I should say, just so you know, um, is um, uh, Chris Anderson, just a wonderful, wonderful, and speaking of leaps, I was actually thinking of, of the way he leaps in poems when um, talking about Mary's poems earlier, because he really believes in having like a big surprising leap, and he thinks it's sort of that leap is the voice of God. He's a Catholic deacon. We had him both on the Rattlecast and interviewed him for our Poets of Faith issue, um, but I'm not really aware of a sort of literary Christian community as such, so I'm kind of curious to see where that is or, you know, who houses that, where, where is that? Um, so if you can leave comments about that, I'm curious what you mean by that, Colin, because um, it would be cool. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the poem. There's two of them. As I said, Broken For You is the first. Um, this is Colin Sandberg, Broken For You. I prayed, but not enough to rid the awkward posture I'm sure I'm approaching into church with a worthiness of reproach, unworthy of the belonging I long for. Why I am, why am I like this? Why can't I speak or act rightly? A pit wreaks havoc in my stomach. Uneasiness runs queasily out my stuttering throat. Unnecessarily, I escape the conversation too soon. My nails too unkempt for any person of respect to have respect for me, though I know that church is not a common pla- a place, a museum of pretty saints. A Bible falling apart means there's a person not yet still. I'm still falling apart. I sit here in the pew. Dang, I stink. I clench my swamp because... I love my neighbor, I dare not lift my arms in praise, nor should I raise my voice in praise, for I know that dishonest lips and a hypocrite heart are stenches to the Holy One's nose. I groan, but not too loudly, lest my neighbor stranger gives me the attention I oddly crave, and I don't want the sanctuary. Um, I lost my place. Sanctuary is so pristine modern, modular, symmetric, but I am all blood and flux and guts. The music is rhythmic in my the pocket. My soul is a shoulder out of socket. I tear and toss sinful thoughts to the dust, yet still I am stuck in the ache. The singing skitters dissonant in the hole where my distance from Jesus sears. Here, unsure whether it is right for me to receive these elements, I grip them tight with my, with my fists. My friend, open your hands. See, I too am blood and guts. I am constant. I am flux. Eat and drink deeply. Love. So interesting poem, Broken for You. um, And that's Colin Sandberg once again. And I like the sense, I I like the structure of it. I like the way that we have this, um, you know, run-on sentence of stream of conscious writing in a prose block. And then we break it off into this sudden slowdown to the short little lyric. Um, and uh, I think that aspect of it works pretty well. Um, the, uh, at times, it was tough to read this at this length. Um, um, you know, a poem that doesn't, that doesn't stop and doesn't give you any time to breathe. Um, you know, for... For me, I write these things I call train poems, which have a similar kind of shape where it's just run on one long sentence. But I put it in, um, I double space it and add some some gaps in between. So you have a little bit of a sense you can slow down if you need to 
and breathe. It sort of tells you where to breathe. In this, you don't really know where to breathe. It's a tough, um, tough one to get through. So it, it's a, uh, it, it's sort of a lot to read out loud, and uh, and that I think so. Maybe I would find a little a form that um, you know, tightening it up, shortening it a little bit. Um, and I think that was one of the things you thought, right? Yeah, broken for you, made to me shortened it. You know, because it goes from interesting to tedious to read. And you don't want to be in the tedious very long. Um, and I think it, if it was shorter, we wouldn't have that problem. So I think cutting out some of that would work really well. Um, let's see what other people are saying about it before we talk more. Um, so, yeah, so Clayton Clark said, I like the rambling, might shorten it. Um, Yeah, so Sandra Fee says, I can imagine the poem starting a bit later. The first few lines feel more like warming up. Um, let's see. Go back to that question that um, Hedge or Hege Jacobson Lepre says, image journal and the Glenn workshop are what I think of when I hear Christian literary community. Yeah, image is a great, great source too. That's great. The one, um, yeah. Gary Rossin says, Googling Facebook Christian literary group brings up a a bunch of Facebook groups. The the problem is, and I and the reason why I was wondering about it is because um, both I'm thinking of Chris Anderson, who's um, that Catholic deacon I mentioned, and he does a great thing too. If you go to his website, I think it's deaconchrisanderson.com, maybe. Um, uh, let me see. We'll find out what it is. Yeah, deaconchrisanderson.com. But the actual title of his website is, as you will see. Um, hang on, let me let it load. Is the imperfect Catholic homilies, poems, and short prose pieces by Chris Anderson, and it, you can subscribe, and you get every Sunday, uh, you get a new homily, and um, and usually it's a little a bit of a prayer and story with a poem attached. So um, let me see if he has the last one. Um, Let's see. Well, anyway, so you can see this kind of, but you get this by email, and it's really nice, actually, because um, he's a great, gifted writer. But the thing I was saying, though, is that um, I talked to both him and I talked to um, Rachel Custer about this, too, because she's a Christian poet and brilliant as well. And um, having, like, good poetry within the Christian community is something that's really not as present. It's, it's almost like a, a place that would be great to have great poetry, um, but if you do, as uh, Winston suggests, if you Google those workshops and look at it, it's nothing literary at all. It's sort of like doggerel and, you know, Instagram poetry and things like that. And, you know, serious Christian poets are something that doesn't, to me, it, it's tough to find a community. And that's that's been like, like Chris Anderson's uh, difficulty, too, is finding, like you would think if there was a Christian literary community that was sort of thriving and like sort of treated both weightily or something. Chris Anderson would have a huge audience. He's got a great book too. Um, the book is um, Light When It Comes, um, which you can see here. Um, Trust, joy, facing darkness, and seeing God in everything. And um, and I just love it. And I'm not Christian. Um, you know, I, I just sort of love, <laughs> I love creation maybe, but um, in all its forms, I guess you could say. But um but it's cool, and Chris is great, and I, uh, his, his look, the next thing always, I think I saw, yeah, it's right there. The next uh, thing always belongs is another one of his great books of poetry. Um, but anyway, he had trouble finding an audience um, because, you know, the it's sort of a hallmark verse that sort of dominates that as far as, as what I am aware of. But anyway, that was a long, long side note, but I'm, I am always curious about that. Let's get back to uh, Colin's poem, and here it is. So, um. Yeah, so let's see. How can we shorten this? Like, we'll highlight like what we can cut, and um, let me go back here. Ah, Plow. Yeah. So, so Am Jester is now the editor of Plow. He was the editor of First Things for a while too. Um, yeah. Okay, so let, let's continue the poem, though. 
So broken for you. And somebody has suggested like that it starts a little late. So we could maybe, or starts, the poem starts after the first few lines maybe. So let's look, look at what we can cut and how we can shorten it up. I prayed for you, but not enough to rid the awkward posture. I'm sure I'm approaching into church with this worthiness of reproach, worthy, unworthy of belonging. I long for, why am I like this? Why can't I speak or act rightly? A pit wreaks havoc in my stomach. Uneasiness runs queasily out my shuddering throat. Unnecessarily, I escape the conversation. Too soon, my nails too unkempt for any person of respect to have respect for me, though. I know that church is not a place a museum of pretty saints, a Bible falling apart means... To me, the poem is picking up here. And we'll, we'll fix that little typo. Um, where it goes from... Um, yeah. Um, who is it? Mary King says, I started, I know the church is not. Yeah. And I think that is, that's a great stitch because it really picks up here. And it's because um, a museum of pretty saints, a Bible falling apart, it gets to in, into more specificity there. And really, that's always when the poem comes alive, because you can see this, you see this all the time, over and over again, is that we sort of spin our wheels and don't know where to go, and then you can see, like, the moment actual imagery starts to sort of spontaneously appear in the writer's mind. And that's the part where it's, like, in the state of, like, daydreaming, that sort of hypnagogic state. And so, um, and that's the part where real specific images start coming out. Whereas before, these are all generalities. And it's sort of necessary, like, ramp. Like, it's like a, the, um, you know, the landing strip or whatever is the plane's taking off. The runway, that's the word. It's like the runway before the plane's taking off. And you need that to get enough speed. Um, but, but you're not flying yet. And then once the imagery starts sort of spontaneously appearing in your mind, that's when the poem really takes off. And that's why we use the metaphor, it takes off, because that's what it does. And I agree. I think here is where it takes off. So we might be able to cut all this. And then it becomes much more digestible at that length, too. So broken for you. I know that church is not a place, a museum of pretty saints, a Bible falling apart means there's a person not yet still. I'm still falling apart. I sit here in the pew. Dang, I stink. I clench my swamp. (laughs) <laughs> because I love my neighbor, I dare not lift my arms in praise. So see how that just, it feels a lot more alive right there. Um, yeah. Um, so, so, so starting it there, maybe, I think. Um, let me see any other suggestions. James Spender says the image, imagery and state of mind are interesting. Um, and Rebecca Kate says, I love how the first part captures the anxiety and self-loathing that comes with being human, and the change in form is the soothing love we seek in religion. Really cool structure. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, start here. And I think it works. And, and just we're going to listen for where we're really feeling engaged with the writing. And then... Um, and then cut the stuff where we're not feeling engaged. And that's really what, what a workshop is really good for. It's just we can read while paying attention to see where we're engaged. And so I wasn't kind of at first. Then it sort of took off right there. I know that church is not a place for a museum of pretty saints. The Bible falling apart means there's a person not yet still. I'm still falling apart. I sit here in the pew. Dang, I stink. I clench my swamp because I love my neighbor. I dare not lift my arms in praise, nor should I raise my voice in praise, for I know that dishonest lips and a hypocrite heart are stenches. So that whole stenches, where you really, it's not just image. You get the whole sort of emotion, or not emotion, um, the sensory thing going on with all the sound, the smells too. And so it's, you know, stenches to the holy. It's not just, you know, in the earlier section, we would have said blasphemous or some abstract word, but here it stenches to the holy nose. So I groan, but not too loudly, lest my neighbor stranger gives me the attention I oddly crave and don't want. The sanctuary is so pristine, modern, modular, modular, symmetric, but I'm all blood and flux and guts. The music is rhythmic in the pocket. My soul is a shoulder of out of socket. To me, I think the the pocket socket rhyme is a little too, too poety, too much. It doesn't feel natural. Um, and they're so close together. I think it's too uh, intrusive. So I would I would cut rework this a little bit. I think it's sort of a false lead. Um, but anyway, um, is rhythmic in the pocket of my shoulder and is a shoulder out of socket. I tear and toss sinful thoughts to the dust. I like that too. I tear and toss. There's something with the air and os. That nice sound there too. Tear and toss sinful thoughts to the dust. Yet still I am stuck in the ache. The singing skitters dissonant in the hole where my 
distance from Jesus sears here, unsure whether it is right for me to receive these elements. I grip them tight within my fists. Um, I think maybe within my fists is a little too much. I trim that out. Um, yeah. And I think maybe that's it. And then we jump from there to my friend, open your hands. See, I too am blood and guts. I am constant. I am flux. Eat and drink deeply. Love. Hmm. And I wonder, so I think, so tightening up that works really well. Just to, really to me, the beginning and the end, and then there's just one little pocket socket thing that's too forced, too, too strong a rhyme. Um, Dick Westheimer says the near rhyme of pocket and toss is great. Um, yeah, so, so if you're going to have a pocket and a socket like that, that's one of the times where Dick was saying before going down to a near rhyme, a slant rhyme, something, you know, so so pocket and like lack it, you know, I lack that type thing or something like that where it's a little off makes a lot more sense. Um, uh, Mary King says F it would be a good slant rhyme with pocket. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So my friend, open your hands. See, I too am blood and guts. I am constant. I am flux. So I think that eat and drink deeply love. I don't think that quite works either. I like this transition to the voice, the slow down, the calm down. The, I love the open your hands, see two I am blood and guts. I think that's great. I am constant. I am flux. I wonder if it just ends there. The eat and drink deeply love. Um, hmm. Jay Spencer says uh, the adverb is not necessary. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe I am flux, eat and drink, love. I wonder if, um, so for here, I would maybe eat and drink and something surprising instead of this. And maybe because you have so many rhymes, um, you know, we have the guts and the flux. What I would do is sort of search in this section for a rhyme that we could pull up here and get us somewhere surprising with this last word. Yeah, Gary Rosen says eat and drink refers to the sacrament, of course. Yeah. Um, and so how can we, what can we pull out here? Like sort of, um, you know, what you want to try to do is just sort of say the words out loud and let your mind wander while you're doing it and come to a nice, a, a nice word. That, that surprises you but fits right. And I think the subconscious will come up with that if you do that. I think it could end in flux too. Um, I mean, as a poem, so as a poem, I would just end in the flux. We have the, rhyme, the near rhyme with guts, and it feels nice. And I think to me, um, what follows, that eat, eat and drink, love, that kind of thing, is implied in who I am. And so I don't think it's necessary. Um, and so I would end up with the flux um, but if, but I can understand how you would want to continue the poem too, and it sort of makes sense to do so. So if so, I would find another rhyme there. Um, Bark, Joe Barker says, "Eat and drink enough." Yeah, I don't know. So play with that. See if there's one word at the end that might work, or end in flux. Um, yeah. So yeah. So everybody from a poetry perspective is saying it in flux, and I do like that. Um, okay. But, but, but that, so the reason why I'm saying that maybe you might not want to is because, um, as uh, Colin was saying, he wanted to specifically address a Christian community. And there's a different sort of purpose um, to do that. And having things laid out a little bit more can make sense in that context. And I do think, look at what Chris Anderson does with his storytelling for the Christian community, too, because um, he does it. He reads poems in front of his congregation every Sunday um, as part of his homily that he does. Um, and, and how he uses storytelling in that manner. And, and sort of he leads people a little bit farther because it has sort of a different requirement, a different need that it's fulfilling than just us listening to the music of poetry. Um, and so, yeah, so, so anyway, play with that ending and see what happens. Okay, let's move on to the next poem while we have some time. And the next one is Homo. And... Um, Let's see. Okay, here we go. I will just read it because there's stuff that I don't exactly, I'm kind of familiar with um, and kind of not. So we'll see. Homo. Pontius placed God in the flesh to his left, all battered and bordeaux. 
his eye a plumbed by beatings swole. Thorns protrude atop his crown, all brown and marlow. The power Pilate holds is not his, but borrowed. By holy providence he bellows with a Roman snarl, Ecce homo. Those words, echoed by anthropologists like Pilate, assist the Christian apologist. The same question we all ask, quid es veritas? To answer that exhume those pre-ancient bones of our apparent great-grandparents called Australopiths. But then finding a cranium that could almost house our intelligence, they claimed him as our own, exulting ecce homo. He is us, they said. Homo erectus, behold, the son of man stands, his femur bearing Atlantean loads, his back ornate with wild flickings from Neanderthal's wrists, his hot ears blear with the sapien cries, Crusa, crus, crusage, crusage, no, crusage, crusage, Satan, searing pure pathos into him, who's taut with dehydration, and a despair primal as a serpent's mouth opened. But he, with unswollen eye aflame, with stoic flint shoulders, and falling, and the uh, shoulders the falling human race, and lifts. Um, so, so to me, this poem has some really great runs where the poem is really coming alive. I love a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the descriptions. Um, and, and then there's some places where it sort of flattens and doesn't work as well. It's not running at the same sort of linguistic level. Um, and so again, and then the ending, I'm, I'm just, I, I get a little lost at the ending too. So, um, and so, so the beginning, so homo, I think this, um, I don't know, is a title that sort of leads you in a wrong, in a wrong direction and maybe that's intentional, but I don't know it. Um, you know, you think it's going to be about homosexuality, given our current culture. And, um, and so it's a sort of a strange title to leap with because it's sort of a false lead and ends up like um, going nowhere because of that. I think Echo Homo would be a better um, title because then you know the context immediately instead of being confused by it. Um, but I think even that, the title isn't really serving any function. So I think the, the title is a place we can find some answers to maybe what we might want to help the poem with. Um, Joe Becker says, too many words need to be tightened up. Joe Becker says, I really like the third stanza. I like the third and the first. I think those work really well. But we'll, we'll go through the poem a little bit in a little more depth. Uh, Pontius placed God in the flesh to his left, all battered and bordeaux. I love that battered and bordeaux. That's cool. His eye a plum by beatings, swole. Thorns protrude atop his crown, all brown and marlow. The power, so they're really great sounds, great music in that, that first four lines. The power pilot holds, and we have the, you know, holds Marlowe. So a great, great ear for music in this poem. Uh, the power pilot holds is not his, but borrowed. By holy providence, he bellows, and there's the borrowed bellows, really great sounds. He bellows with that Roman snarl, ecce homo. Hopefully I'm saying that right, ecce, ecce. Um, yeah. Uh, Mary King says the poem felt too dense and heavy and lost my interest. And then so, yeah, so the first stanza sort of sets up a nice thing. There's the music that we can, even if the poem's sort of dense and heavy, we can enjoy the music and, and be carried away by it. And it, to me, I think that's great. And we, I, I'll give a lot of slack for following along if it sounds great, which it does. Um, and now here we shift register completely, though. Um, and also interesting that we do it with a sort of weird, I didn't know how to make this jump because we have no punctuation either which is sort of a sign the, um, that the poet didn't really know how to make this transition, and it's not really a complete poem. Like, as an editor, I kind of see that and, and see that that is a common thing in submissions. But here, here how the, the tone of the poem shifts. The music drops away, and we get this sort of expository writing instead. Those words echoed by anthropologists. Even though there's the rhyme, we have the anthropologists and the apologists, and we're trying to, f but there's still a total shift in register uh, where it's not flowing out musically anymore. Those words echoed by anthropologists like Pilate assist the Christian apologist. The same question we all ask, quid es veritas? And so what is, who is truth? Quid, what is, that is true? What is that? Quid? I gotta look that up. And, um, and the echo homo, um, I would have to look up. I, I kind of know what it means, like, like us or like this. And it, it's listed down here. He is us. That's what echo homo is. Um, 
Margarita says, homo, like the first poem goes overboard linguistically. It would be better if toned down. The wine images don't work for me. Um, so, right, so quid est veritas. Let me see what that that means. Um, uh, uh, what is truth? Okay, so what is truth? And that's from John eighteen thirty seven. Um, the same question we all ask, what is truth? Um, and so that, I don't know how, how well known that phrase is. Um, and I wonder if it would help us. I mean, th there is a kind of thing, um, where the title could be, what is truth to help us? Um, I don't, I don't know how common knowing that translation is. What is truth? And that, that excerpt from John is, um, even among, you know, I mean, talking about the Christian community, um, I don't know. I don't know how well Christians would recognize that either. Um, you know, the, the Latin, just the typical, you know, Christians that I would know. I mean, I have read the Bible twice and took a literature of the Bible class separate from that and spent some time in church. And um, I don't know. It, it doesn't strike me as that everybody knows all the verses like that, but but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just ignorant, and that's something that people would recognize. Um, but I'm kind of curious about that. But a little help with that might be helpful. To answer that exhume those pre-ancient bones for our apparent great-grandparents called Australopithecus. So, so this is all very... I mean, you could feel how, you know, we're talking about that right brain, left brain thing. This is all right brain, and then we get to the left brain that, that already has the model worked out feeling where we're sort of explaining and teaching and expository writing rather than letting the poem flow out of us spontaneously. So, so this fe part feels just off to me in the way that it's sort of didactic. Um, that to answer that exhume those pre-ancient bones of our apparent great-grandparents called Australopiths, then, but then finding a cranium that could almost house our intelligence, they claim him as our own, Ecce Homo. He is us, they said. And so now we get back. Once we start describing again, we get that image in our head, we start describing, and we get back into that flow where the language is propelling the poem, and sort of we're, you know, we're transcribing it. He is us, they said, homo erectus. Uh, behold, the Son of Man stands, his femur bearing Atlantean loads, his back ornate with wild flickings from Neanderthal wrists, his hot ears bleared with the sapient cries, Crucage, crucage, Satan searing pure pathos into him, who's taut with dehydration and a despair primal as a serpent's mouth opened. So that's very vivid and sort of once again engaged, although I don't understand where the, the meaning of it, because there's not enough here, there's not sort of enough resolution. But he, with unswollen eye aflame, with stoic flint, shoulders the falling human race and lifts. And so to me, it feels like an incomplete poem. Um, you know, I think there's, um, there's a lot of ideas sort of swirling around in it that we want to put in a poem. And you can see the impetus for it, that there's a real poem there, but it's not fully developed. And I think part of it is, you know, this section, and you can even just see it visually. It's like we have this stanza, this stanza, this stanza, and then this little tiny thing. And it's not like it, you know, in the last poem, it was so clearly intentional, and it worked. It, it served a huge function to structure the poem like that, to have this prose and then the short lines as you totally change voice and someone else is speaking in, in a calm way. It's, it's great. Um, here, we don't have that. And, and you can see that the poem wants to have more. Um, you know, this should be as big as this. Um, and maybe this should be two sections um, where we... we don't have to explain it as sort of technically and didactically, but get to it more um, through a sort of a flow state, let's say. So um, so to me, it's like the, the bones of a poem that hasn't been fully developed yet. And I, and I think what I would focus on is finding a way in to explain this um, just in a more direct, visceral type way, and then, and then come to more of a resolution. Because um, I can see the... You know, the he is us, but, but is, um, you know, is, is Jesus related to Homo erectus, too? And how does that fit together? And how that is similar to um, the crucifixion scene, you know, and all of that story. Um, I, it's a really interesting thing to play with. I just don't think it's fully played out. So I think this is one to expand. But it's a cool idea for a poem, and I definitely would. 
Um, let me see what other people are saying. Um, Jed Philip Johnson, a Christian poet, because he's from our um, Poets of Faith issue, I know, said, um, quid est veritas. Many would recognize it. Um, yeah. Okay. Behold the man. Yeah. All right. So anyway, that's my my opinion there. Um, Clayton Clark, tons of potential in this poem. Second stanza is textbookish. That's a great way to put what I was trying to say. Um, Colin Sandberg himself, the author, says, what do you think of ending it with the third stanza? And I think that could work if we had just sort of more clarity and, and wasn't so textbookish in this, um, in this second stanza. And so, so I think maybe this stanza, this one wants to be two, and then you end here. Might be a way to go. Mary Keating says the last stanza could almost be a haiku, and that's really interesting, too, because you can have, um, as we've seen with some poems, and especially Lou Watts does this kind of thing a lot, um, and, and uh, Roberta Berry, too, you know, you can have a poem be, be the lead section of a uh, hyphen and uh, end with a haiku there. It would be interesting, too. Um, yeah. Sander Fees says, I can imagine playing around so that there isn't so much emphasis on capitalizing words, which is really distracting and feels very heavy. I think that also leads away from describing. Um, hmm, yeah. Joe Becker says the bones are there, and that's my feeling too. It's just the bones are there, but not, um, but not developed. PMB says a poem that asks what is truth will never be complete. Um... Yeah. Okay. So so we have a sort of a structure. We have a, a direction for you to go with this one, Colin. Um, not as clean as the other the other edit, because um, I think it's a it's a underdeveloped poem that deserves more developing. Um, but the, but that's the direction to take it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's going to wrap up the show. Hope this was helpful to uh, both poets this week. Um, as always, if you like this, what you've seen, haven't clicked the like button yet, make sure you do click like button. People watch this after the fact, even though we have a great crew on hand live. So do click the like button now if you haven't yet. And uh, that's going to wrap up the show for this week. Now, uh, this week's, like I said too, I should mention, uh, this week's Poetry Space just came out. If you want to find that, uh, that's the show Katie Dozier produces. Uh, and I'm a co-host. You can find that by typing the Poetry Space into Spotify or um, iTunes or anything like that. Today's episode was about music that just came out and um, with Wendy Vidalock, who was just the best at writing musical poetry and rhyme. Really great, because Dick Westheimer suggested it in the comments just now, so I, sh- I should say that he recommends it highly. Dick is there very often and was this week, um, and uh, it's always great. Now, uh, this week's guest on the Rattlecast coming up is going to be right about <laughs> here. So George B- Belgier is the guest. Of course, he's the last of uh, last year's Chapbook Prize winners for Cheap Motels of My Youth, a great, great book of poems um, by a great poet. He's always such so fun, such a great storyteller, a lot of humor, a lot of heart in his poems. He was the guest on a previous Rattlecast, too. He's coming back because of this new chapbook uh, for Rattlecast number 240. And do note the special time. Even though it's cloudy and stormy and we aren't get to see the eclipse, we wanted to drive out from where we are a couple hours to see the eclipse with the girls, and it's not going to happen probably. But (laughs) we did, just in case we got stuck in all that eclipse traffic. We moved the show up to Tuesday. Um, So it's going to be Tuesday, April 9th this week. It's just a one-time move to Tuesday to avoid all the eclipse traffic. Uh, But the regular time, though, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific with George Bilgier. The the, The prompt for this week which I'm going to add to um, the, prompt, uh, the prompt category finally in a moment, is to write a poem that includes internal rhyme in every line um, in honor of sort of the music of Wendy Vidalock and things like that. Should be a lot of fun. That's your prompt for this week. Feel free to go wherever you want with that. It's a pretty open-ended prompt. And our guest is the great George Bill Gear, Rattlecast 240. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>